Okay, we can have more complex such systems. Let me just briefly show you another, you know, I could be asleep, for example, or awake. These are my two states. And then I have the transitions between states. So asleep, uh, when the alarm clock rings, I, I take it to the transition and then I become awake. And when I'm awake, and then I go to bed after a while I fall asleep. This is the transition condition. And then um, the moment I enter the state of being awake, I stop the alarm, right? The moment I enter the state of being asleep, I set the alarm. This is an entry condition, right? Um, and now I can also add additional states. So now we make it more interesting, right? So I, I not only have asleep and awake, um, this you see some of the states are the same asleep set alarm awake stop alarm we have the alarm clock ringing between them this is the same but now i have a new state preparing for sleep so when i start preparing for sleep my entry condition is to brush my teeth let's say right uh, and and how do i transition from awake to preparing for sleep for example a particular time is reached right 9 9 p.m when it's 9 p.m i go from awake to preparing for sleep and now after I have prepared for sleep, I have brushed my teeth, so now the next state is to go to bed where then I fall asleep, right? I can also have states where the following state is the same state. For example, I can be asleep and then in the night I wake up before my alarm has rung because if the alarm rings, I'm going to the state of being awake. But in the night now, it can happen that I briefly wake up. I'm not fully awake. My alarm is not rang. What happens is that I turn around in my bed and fall asleep again. Then I have a state that leads to the following state, which is itself. And this is what you see here, uh, this little arrow at asleep that just turns around and goes back to asleep. Now I can start still produce more complex finite state machines. I can say I have a state of lecturing uh, for a professor, right? The, the life of a professor, I have a state of lecturing. I have a state of listening. I'm lecturing, the student asks a question, the professor then is in the state of listening. Um, he, assuming he answers the questions, right? And then the lecture time is not over. So this is a transition condition to go to lecture some more. Right? This could be the endless loop of somebody who is lecturing, like myself just now, but you cannot answer questions. So this um, is the good thing. I can talk as much as I like. So, okay, now we have, you recognize on the left side, the same thing like before, lecturing and listening. Now we have a new state walking on campus. So now we, we try to enrich the life of this guy. Uh, after listening, look at listening now and then on the right side the lecture time is over right so now the lecturing time is over he doesn't go back to lecturing but instead now he walks on campus he walks on campus until it's time for the lecture to begin and then he falls into lecturing again he does all these things until the lecture time is over in the state of lecturing then he goes back to walk into campus so you have two times lecture time is over. One is for lecture time is over if you are in listening. One is lecture time is over if you are in lecturing. It doesn't matter in the end. Both go back to walking on campus. We can also model more of the life of this guy, right? We can we can say he has a home, obviously, right? Professors also have a home, which students not often appreciate because uh, they want uh, their professors to answer questions uh, on Saturday night by email, but. Don't do this because we also have a home. And so we walk on campus and then at some point the working day is over and then the professor goes into the state of walking home. He arrives at home, which is the transition condition to eating. And eating, what happens before the eating is an entry condition is to greet your spouse, right? And then you start eating uh, and so on. And then we have all these previous you remember we talked about the alarm and the sleeping. This now is a is an encapsulated sub finite state machine which we can just plug in there uh, to put all these states of sleeping and waking and and uh, alarm in there, um, 
and then our professor has this behavior too, right? So we can add a whole block of behavior by adding it there, plugging it in. And at the end of getting up, uh, he stops the alarm, he gets dressed, he walks to campus again, and then he's back at the university and the thing goes on. So this is, um, you see, when you look at it, um, it's not supposed to be realistic. It is supposed to show you that you can describe quite a lot of behavior in this way. It has the nice property of being easily transferable into a computer program. These states and these transitions um, can be states in a computer program uh, that can be directly, you know, programmed there with, with a variable that keeps the state uh, and functions that represent the um, transitions which change the value of this variable. So this is, is trivial to make it a computer program. Um, and then this computer program would describe the behavior of the system. And the other nice thing is, you also saw this with the alarm or with the lecturing, that we can take parts of this, you know, closed little um, subsystems and plug them in. So you can work on this in a modular way. You could say, you know, one group in the class uh, models the sleeping behavior, one group in the class models the eating behavior, and then in the end we just need to plug the things together. So it is not like one person needs to do this alone and have the whole thing in their mind. It is modular, right? It is modular in a way that can be, in, in that it can be created in pieces that can later be plugged together. So why are finite state machines important for AI? They help us describe and model behavior in a way which can be easily simulated by a machine. Very complex behaviors can be constructed using aggregate machines or layers of finer state machines, what I just said, right? You can plug in the sleeping behavior, plug in the eating behavior. And a finer state machine is not limited to describing behavior. It can describe, for example, mental states. It can describe transitions between mental states. So now very briefly, I will show you a few more which I found on the internet somewhere. You can just look yourself uh, to find more. Just uh, search, you know, find a state machine, do an image search. Then you will find uh, many such uh, diagrams. So this would be for a simple game. If we look here, right, a simple computer game, we have some monster. Uh, you have the player character. The, the player character is gathering treasure on the left side, right? Um, and then he sees a monster. So we go to the right upper uh, arrow. He sees the monster. After he sees the monster, he flees. He runs away from the monster. After he flees successfully, he doesn't see the monster anymore. He goes back to gathering treasure. This is the one part of the FSM. Now, if while he's fleeing, he's cornered by the monster, he doesn't flee successfully, but the, the monster catches him, he's cornered, then he has to fight. So now we go into a fight, uh, which which the whole fight can be another finer state machine, right? It can expand into a whole set of 200 different fighting states. And then at some point the monster is dead, and then he can go back to gathering treasure. This is uh, how many computer games actually work by implementing such finite state machines. You can see a more complex one here. If you look, uh, this is also somewhere from the internet. Um, I don't have the source right now, but you can find it in the lecture notes. Uh, you can see, um, just as an example, you have all kinds of jumps. This is for a run and jump game, right? You have double jumps and run jumps and run and run attack and action and idle attack. And the transitions between them then are uh, either um, uh, particular velocities, uh, when it's fast or slow, the things happen, or um, the transitions uh, are triggered by key presses, right? So you press the key for jumping and then your figure jumps. And in this way, a program of this game can describe how the character will behave in response to user input and in response to the game in-game environment in which the character is without having to to visualize everything in his mind the moment he's coding it, right? So you can give this abstract description that the game designer and the programmer and the character animator, they can all agree on these particular steps. Uh, they can cooperate. 
without needing to be able to program this, right? Because they have here an abstract map of this behavior. So we want to do an exercise, uh, which you will do at home. So write a final state machine which describes the behavior of a dog or a cat at home and that could be used to program a robotic pet. You, you don't need to make it very complicated. Try to aim perhaps for five or six uh, states and then to um, define transitions and entry and exit actions and try to make it as realistic as possible. You will see it's a lot of fun and it will give you some insight. Uh, you will have to observe the behavior of a pet. You have to think for a moment, what do pets actually do all day when I'm not feeding them, right, or not kicking them? So what, what do they do? You need to um, have some, observe them, you know, in order to uh, be able to make this. And this is the, the point, right? This is the important thing about creating a finite state machine. It forces you to look at the world. It forces you to understand how systems work so that you can model them, okay?